I enjoyed the last three days tremendously. I got to interact with lots of you in the room, and I hope you enjoyed the interactions just as much as I enjoyed them. Um, in this lecture, I would like to bring you at, to your attention how important convection is, um, and how important it is for the climate, how important it is for weather, and you will be very well aware for things like water resources, and also how important it is to uh, get right in climate models and to do a good job in simulating it. And I'll give you a bit of an impression where we stand on that very important problem. My motivation in all my career was to try and improve how convection is represented in climate models. And to do that, one needs to understand how convection interacts with larger scales. So the, this lecture will be largely about how convection interacts with larger scales. And then right at the end, we'll talk a little bit about climate models and how that affects climate models. But mostly, I want to look at the interaction of convection with large scales. As is typical for when you get old, you stop doing active work. Uh, instead, you supervise lots of people doing active work and you help them achieve their goals. And down here, at the bottom of my screen, I'm going to find it in a second, there you go, is a long list of names. And all these people are the actual people who did the work that I have the pleasure of presenting today. Um, they worked with me on this, on several of the topics that I'm going to cover. Okay. Oh, this doesn't come through very well at all, does it? Okay, so we'll, we'll have to make do. So convection, I def what you meant to see, I'll describe what you meant to see, which is not very visible on the screen, is convection is very important. It's a very important ingredient to the climate system. And it's a very important ingredient to the climate system because it affects major circulation systems on Earth. And what you meant to see is deep convective clouds here. Here's the equator. Here's uh, the subtropics. And there's, very, and there's deep convective clouds on my screen right here. There's shallow convective clouds in the middle. And there's stratocumulus clouds over here. And they are embedded. These clouds are all convective clouds. So Many of us think of convection just as deep clouds that uh, produce precipitation, but shallow clouds, shallow convective clouds exist, and even stratocumulus clouds, strictly speaking, are convective clouds. They're embedded in this circulation, and they strongly affect that circulation. And uh, on the right here, you can see that, uh, the vertical profile of temperature and humidity for its actually equivalent potential temperature and humidity for the deep convective clouds in red, the shallow convective clouds in yellow, and the stratocumulus clouds in blue. Um, and what you, what you will recognize is that the atmospheric state, the thermodynamics of the atmosphere, is very, very different depending on where you are. Um, in the tropics, we have very moist and very deep structures, very high relative humidity, very deep. By the time we get to the stratocumulus region in the subsiding part of the Hadley cell, we see a very large humidity near the surface and then very dry air above that. So convection is embedded in this circulation, but it's also driving this circulation. And it's a very important part. The Hadley cell is obviously a very important part of the climate system. Convection also affects regional circulations very, very strongly. And I would be amiss uh, not to put an example of the monsoon in when I give a lecture on convection in India. So this is an example of uh, one year. Um, it's outgoing long wave radiation. Where it's blue, the outgoing long wave radiation is very low. Uh, where it's uh, red or even brown, the outgoing long wave radiation is very high. What you see is the seasonal cycles, January at the top, December at the bottom. And this is the OLR. And as I said, uh, blue is low, which means there's many high clouds in the atmosphere. And you can, and it's uh, averaged over 70 to 90 degrees east, so it's near the Bay of Bengal. And this is the latitude here. And you can see as summer approaches, convection, which sits uh, near the equator over the tropical ocean, propagates northward and becomes the Indian monsoon, basically. Um, and you can also see that this uh, is by no means a steady process. Whilst the envelope of the convection steadily moves northward, you see these episodes of very strong convection with interludes of very weak convection. And of course, we all know this as active and break periods in monsoons. Another example for convection very strongly affecting a regional circulations or even local circulations is over the maritime continent 
What I'm showing you in this little movie is the diurnal cycle of precipitation over the maritime continent. Um, and uh, the local time in Western Australia, so in the center of this graph, is, is shown here. So we're now in the evening, we're going into the night, and now in the morning and the afternoon. And what you can see by following this movie is that this very strong convection over the islands, over the land masses of the maritime continent, during the day and in the afternoon, and very strong convection, very strong rainfall associated with convection offshore of the islands in the evening and at night. So we have this very smooth propagation of convection from land to ocean and back to land to ocean. It's almost like the land is breathing the, uh, uh, through the convection, and the ocean is breathing through the convection um, more or less every day during the um, appropriate season. So this is for December. What is remarkable about convection and important about convection is that it actually affects um, both the rainfall and the radi radiative budget. So it, therefore it affects both, it affects the heat budget of the atmosphere through late heating, it affects the heat budget of the atmosphere through radiation, and it affects the water budget through precipitation. So what you're meant to see on the left here is the annual cycle of precipitation, where red is a lot of precipitation, blue is not so much precipitation. And on the right-hand side, we see the effects of clouds on the radiative budget at the top of the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, and at the surface. And what you see on this uh, right-hand graph for radiation, as well as the uh, precipitation um, animation, is that the tropical regions have very high values of rainfall associated with convection. They move north and south with the seasonal cycle. But you can also see that where those large rainfall um, regions are, are also the regions of the largest effects of clouds on the radiation budget. And those clouds are produced by convective processes. So we are very interested uh, in disentangling um, the radiative and uh, late heating processes and their effect on the circulation. And we really, to understand how convection works, we need to understand how it interacts with all these uh, circulation systems that we find on Earth. Okay, so the question I'd like to discuss with you today is what controls where convection occurs, when convection occurs, what controls the spatial and temporal distribution of convection, um, and uh, the answer, as you will see, is dependent on scale. So we will start with the uh, global scale. So my question to you and maybe the students who were in my classes the last few days, they will already know the answer. What controls the global mean precipitation on Earth? It's a very simple question, one would think, um, and one that we should be able to answer. What is it that controls global mean precipitation on Earth? Well, what controls global mean precipitation, not necessarily its distribution, but the global mean value, is simply the uh, radiative cooling of the atmosphere. So there's an energy constraint on how much it can rain on the Earth. Um, and it's very simply explained by a traditional textbook style uh, figure of the global energy budget. And all we are interested in and have to look at for now is the surface. So we get about 150 watts per meter square of solar radiation absorbed at the surface. We get about 350 absorbed by uh, long wave radiation, downward long wave radiation. So that gives 500. There's about 400 uh, watts per meter square going out from the surface. So there's an imbalance of about 100 watts per meter square. And what compensates for that imbalance, as you've all learned probably in first year meteorology, is turbulent fluxes of heat and moisture. And most of those fluxes are fluxes of moisture. And those fluxes of moisture get into the atmosphere and ultimately produce precipitation. Most of that flux of moisture leads to precipitation and heating. So in other words, the cooling of the atmosphere is to a large extent setting how much global mean rainfall we are going to get. That means if the global mean rainfall is to change under climate change or in climate variability, the global mean number will only change if, the, if we either have an imbalance, so we are not in equilibrium, and that can happen but only for short periods of time, or if we change the atmospheric cooling. 
And then we can change the atmospheric cooling by changing the composition of the atmosphere or by changing the clouds. <coughs> well, we can change the clouds by changing the convection, which will then change the convection uh, because we've changed the clouds. So you can already see that there's many feedbacks in this problem that make the problem very hard and very difficult to get uh, our heads around. So let's stay with this global picture for a little longer. Um, this is a very well-known phenomenon, which is called uh, radiative convective equilibrium. The term was first used in the 1960s, and Manabi and Strickler in 1964 published a pretty seminal paper where they basically asked the question to, to represent the observed global mean temperature profile in the atmosphere. Um, what is the balance between processes that leads to the right um, temperature profile? And the first assumption was imagine the Earth was just in radiative equilibrium. The only process that was happening was radiation. And if you did that and they did the calculation, the temperature profile looks like this line down here. And that line is way too steep a uh, lapse rate compared to observations. And then they said, oh, maybe we are missing um, a mixing process. We are missing the, the, the compensation of that radiative cooling by something. What if that something was dry adiabatic motion and dry adiabatic turbulence? Well, then you end up with this line, which is the dry adiabatic lapse rate, which is also not correct compared to what is observed. And so very quickly they realize, ah, there is another process going on, and that's condensation in convective clouds in the tropical regions. And so the, the um, temperature is actually not following a dry adiabat, but it's much closer to a moist adiabat, an adiabatic ascent that includes condensation. And that resulted in this line. What's remarkable in those days, they had no observations to, to check uh, uh, much of this. And we can now take some of these ideas of radiative convective equilibrium and we can ask, does it actually exist in the real world from observations? And that's what I'm showing on the right-hand side here. So the x-axis of this graph on the right-hand side is the atmospheric cooling. So how much does the atmosphere cool by radiation? You calculate that by looking at the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere minus the net radiation at the bottom of the atmosphere. And the value is about 100 watts per meter squared, globally averaged, okay, roughly. And the y-axis here is the precipitation, the global mean precipitation from observations as well. Um, and each dot is a day in the, in the years 2003 and 2004. We've since extended this to, 2000, to, to 10 years' worth of data. But this graph is from two years' worth of data, and it doesn't change. Um, so each dot is a day. So every day we are asking, what's the atmospheric cooling and what's the precipitation? And what you see is that the two are very closely related to each other, just as is predicted by radiative convective equilibrium. So we are in, in good shape in the global mean. You can see a bit of an offset. Um, so the, radi the precipitation is on the order of uh, maybe 80 or 90 on average. The cooling is somewhere between 90 and 100. So there's about 10, 15 watts per meter square missing. And that's, of course, the sensible heat flux that we are not including in this analysis. But overall, this is kind of nice because we can say on a global average, we know what controls convection. We know how much convection and we know how much rainfall we're going to get if we know how much the atmosphere cools. So the next question you might then have, well, maybe we are done. Maybe um, we can just use this to parameterize convection in a model because, you know, if we know that we can calculate the radiative cooling and then we know how much rain there is. But for that to be true, we need to first check whether this equilibrium also works on smaller scales. So does radiative convective equilibrium also explain the behavior of convection on smaller scales? And the answer is a resounding no. And here's uh, the, the evidence for it. So these are the same two years. We start with one point in the Western Pacific, and you can pick a point anywhere in the tropics, they all look the same. We picked one in the Western Pacific. And the x-axis is, again, the radiative cooling. Um, so it's like 250 watts per meter square, uh, no, 200, 150, 100 is about here. And the y-axis is precipitation, and that now goes, and you can't see it, so I will tell you, that now goes all the way up to 1,000 watts per meter square. And what you see is if you go to a single grid point, there is no radiative convective, convective equilibrium at all. On the contrary, the more it rains, which is up here, so the highest rainfall rates are up here, um, the less the atmosphere cools radiatively. So it's actually convective, radiative convective anti-equilibrium 
that we find at small scales. And the explanation for that is very simple. The rainfall isn't responding to radiative cooling in the real world on smaller scales. It's responding to dynamical systems and it's interacting with dynamical systems. And as these dynamical systems make clouds and rain, they stop the atmosphere from cooling radiatively. And as a result, we get this anti-equilibrium. Well, you can then ask, well, how much do we have to average until we actually find radiative contact-active equilibrium? So we do this here. This is 10 by 10 degrees, 20 by 20 degrees, 40 by 40, 60 by 60, 90 by 90. And some, by the time we get to about 90 by 90 degrees, we reach a state where we can say, well, maybe we are most of the time close to radiative convective equilibrium. So this radiative convective equilibrium is a useful concept, but only on very, very large scales. Okay? So that's one thing that we've learned. We can look at this a bit more, and, and, and it actually becomes quite obvious by looking at some maps, for instance. So this is the map of two-year average of radiative cooling or of the atmosphere, and this is the map of precipitation. And you can see blue means a lot of cooling, and yellow means not so much cooling. And you can see the regions on Earth that have the largest precipitation are the regions that cool the least radiatively. So clearly, the control of convection on even on scales of the ITCZ, cannot be um, radiation. Okay? Um, this you can't see, it doesn't matter. We'll go to the next one. We then ask the question, well, what role does convection play and do different types of convective clouds play in establishing radiative convective equilibrium or not establishing radiative convective equilibrium? And what we have here, the x-axis is, uh, and I, I won't have the chance to explain to you how exactly we did this. Uh, I've lost my mouse, sorry. I lost my pointer. Where's it going? There it is. So the x-axis down here is what we call a distance from radiative convective equilibrium. So every day at every good point we are asking how close to convective equilibrium are we. And this is for a 10 by 10 degree uh, area. And so we're asking the question, how, how far away from convective equilibrium are we? And this is, we are far away from convective equilibrium in the sense that it cools much more than it rains. And on this side, we are far away from radiative convective equilibrium where it rains more than it cools. And then down here we are in, in the middle, we are in radiative convective equilibrium. And then we ask the question, what kind of clouds do we find in these 10 by 10 degree boxes when we are far away? from radiative convective equilibrium. And we have five classes. The pink class is organized deep convection. The red class is unorganized deep convection. Orange is sort of congestus convection, not very deep convection. Yellow is cirrus without any convection. And green are low clouds. And this provides great insight as to how this radiative convective equilibrium actually works on Earth. If you are on the, this side, you see most of the clouds that you find are low clouds in the atmosphere. And when you find low clouds in the atmosphere, we see that you get strong cooling, but no, uh, but no rainfall, and so therefore we are far away from radiative convective equilibrium in the other one direction. If we go over here, we see it's mostly pink and red, so we have organized and unorganized convection as the main types of clouds that we observe. And uh, we are far away from radiative convective equilibrium in the sense it rains much more than the atmosphere cools. And to be in radiative convective equilibrium, it actually turns out we need a perfect mix of active convection and suppressed conditions. And so if we are in a region where we have only active convection, we can't be in radiative convective equilibrium. If we are in a region where we have only low clouds, we can't either. So we need a mix of the two. And we confirmed this since this will be very hard for you to see with the projector, but I'll, I'll just look at the numbers at the top maybe. So we've confirmed this by actually looking at um, the x-axis is we're making our averaging area bigger and bigger, and the y-axis is how many points um, are in uh, convective radiative equilibrium. And what Lost my mouse again, sorry for that. Here it comes. And what the bottom 
baseline is, is that the ratio, so the, the number of points in radiative convective equilibrium is this black number up the top, and you can see it's only 10% of, uh, of the points are in radiative equilibrium from one by one degree, and that goes up to 90% if you go to 70 by 70 degree averaging. Um, but what the blue number is, and this is a really intriguing finding, is, is the ratio of active convection to suppressed convection. Actually, it's the other way around. Is how many suppressed points do we need for one active point? And what's remarkable about this is after, once we're away from the very small areas, this number is almost constant. It's seven to eight, something like that. So that means to establish radiative convective equilibrium, we need eight points of suppressed conditions for every one point of convection. And so the bottom line actually is the, the way the Earth establishes this equilibrium is by having tropics and subtropics. And the tropics is the region where it rains way more than it cools, and the subtropics are the regions where it uh, cools way more than it rains. The subtropics are much larger than the tropical regions in terms of horizontal extent, and together they are in radiative convective equilibrium. But each one of them is not. So that's the bottom line. So I have conclusions for this part. Um, you don't find radiative convective equilibrium very often on scales large, smaller than about 5,000 by 5,000 square kilometers. This is kind of important because there's an entire community out there doing model simulations today um, where they use 500 by 500 kilometer models and then assume radiative convective equilibrium. Well, that's not a good idea because it's not very realistic for um, the real world. Non-precipitating non -precipitating regions pull the Earth atmosphere away from radiative convective equilibrium, and so do convective regions. So only together can they uh, produce con radiative convective equilibrium. So you have to have a region of convection and you have to have a region of suppressed conditions. And the suppressed region must be larger than the uh, active region. Otherwise, you cannot establish this equilibrium. Okay. So that's nice and interesting and intriguing. However, it doesn't really tell us uh, what happens to convection on smaller scales. So we know the large, the global scale convection is controlled by radiative cooling, right? But we also know this does not hold on smaller scales. It doesn't work. So what is it that happens on smaller scales? Again, there's a graph you can't see, um, but I'll try and explain it to you. There's quasi-equilibrium. You can't see that one either, can you? No. So the quasi-equilibrium assumption is, uh, is an assumption that has been postulated in the 60s and tested in field experiments in the 70s. And the idea, and I can't really demonstrate it from the graphs, is that the large-scale atmosphere cools through ascent, um, but if we measure the temperature in the atmosphere, so we can measure the vertical motion in the atmosphere through, by using radius on the rays in these field experiments, what happens is um, you find that in, in troughs of waves or in troughs of monsoon troughs and so on and so forth, there's strong vertical ascent. And if you do the calculation for adiabatic cooling, that strong adiabatic ascent will cool the atmosphere quite dramatically, actually. But if you measure the temperature at the same time, it doesn't change. So what's going on? And what's going on is the, the postulation of, of many, many scientists in the 60s and 70s is that uh, convection is a fast-acting process that immediately responds to this cooling and actually removes the effects of the cooling very, very quickly through condensation and the generation of precipitation. So that's what's called quasi-equilibrium between, and this holds on scales of a few hundred kilometers now. You don't need thousands of kilometers. And that's interesting because climate model grid boxes are a few hundred kilometers big. So if that's true, then we can perhaps use that to build climate models. What the authors didn't explain very well in the early days is what controls this equilibrium. So that it's there, you can use it, but how does it work? What's actually the controlling variable in this? And to build good models, we need to know that. So recently, we started uh, to look at some observations that we've had for a long time but hadn't really explored very well. To answer that question, what is it that controls convection on a scale of a few hundred kilometers, say? Okay. To do this, we use radar observations um, at the Darwin, in Darwin, Australia. 
Um, so a nice tropical area. It's the sort of cousin of the Indian monsoon. I don't want to brag. We have a monsoon too, but it's kind of small and tiny and teeny weeny compared to yours. But it's there, and so we have a, in, during the wet season, we have break periods, we have a build-up, we have a monsoon, we have break periods, and we have a retreat of the monsoon. And we use all that data for three years. And the first remarkable thing that we found is, if you take an average of all the convective rain in a box, and our box is about 150 by 150 kilometers across, um, this is the x-axis, it's very, very strongly related to the area that's raining. And it's not strongly related at all to the intensity of the rain. So how much it rains per square meter does not matter very much. It matters to the extent that you have scatter in this relationship, of course. But still to first order, this is a very nice straight line with some scatter around it, obviously. Um, and what it means is for nature to make more rain in a, in a box, it's it doesn't choose to make the rain heavier, it chooses to make the rain area larger. Okay. So that's an interesting finding. It's interesting for those of us who deal with models as well, because it implies that maybe by using this area fraction um, somehow in our models, we can do a good job at simulating convection. And none of the current climate models actually uses area fraction in its description of convection. We, this, we since confirmed these results with 16 years of radar data. So this is the same kind of plot. Uh, look just at the right-hand one. This is the area of a rainfall. This is the area of coverage with convection. And the colors is how many points, how many samples do we find. And we have samples every 10 minutes for 16 wet seasons. It's not 16 years, but 16 wet seasons. And our wet season is about seven months long, six months, six to seven months long. All right, so we see there's a very strong relationship between those two. Okay, nice. That still doesn't explain what controls the rainfall. It just says the rainfall is very strongly related to the area that's raining. So now we can ask the question, well, what controls the area that's raining? How is that related to other things in the atmosphere? So we do that. The top graph shows you the convective area fraction um, versus convergence and the convective intensity, so the rain only at the points where it's raining, versus the convergence of moisture into the region. And the bottom one shows the same thing, but the large-scale variable is now not the convergence of moisture, but it's the instability of the atmosphere, as measured by something convection people invented for themselves called K. All right? So the first thing we see is if you just look at the area fraction, which we know is very strongly related to the area mean rainfall, there's a very nice relationship with convergence, but there's no relationship to speak of with instability. So that's a, another surprising finding. In the 70s, people had postulated that this is how convection works, and in the 80s, it was completely dismissed, and everybody said, this is how convection works, and we are stuck with the views of the 80s uh, at the moment. Um, and it's time to actually go back and reinvestigate this a bit more closely. This is the conclusion from here. As far as intensity is concerned, there's very little relationship between the intensity and the convergence, and there's a weak but noticeable relationship between the intensity and K. So from this graph, we conclude that maybe the convective intensity is something that is controlled by the stability of the atmosphere, or the instability in this case. So the more unstable the atmosphere is, the more intense the rain per square meter. But for an area average of 100 by 100 kilometers, some sort of model grid box or a large water catchment, it's much, more, it's much more important how big the area that's raining is. And that's not controlled by instability, but by convergence of air into that region. So that's the conclusion from that. We have another way of, of showing this. This is uh, doing the correlation of this convective area fraction um, with a number of large-scale variables. The red line is the correlation with uh, the large-scale vertical motion at about 500 hectopascal in the middle of the middle troposphere. The black line is the cape. The green line is relative humidity. And instead of just correlating them at the same time, we also do lag correlations in, uh, in time. So what we see is, Similar to what we saw in the scatter plot, Cape, which is the 
black line has a very, very weak correlation with this area fraction. So instability is not very strongly related to area fraction. One nice thing about instability, unfortunately the signal is so weak it's almost useless, is it actually leads convection and once convection happens the instability reduces and the correlation is completely gone after a while. The green line, the humidity, which we'll look at in a minute, has a higher correlation than K. That's pretty remarkable. So the area that's raining is more related to the relative humidity in the middle troposphere than it is to the instability of the atmosphere, which is kind of interesting. But it peaks after the convection peaks, peaks after the peak of the area fraction. So it's probably um, as much a result of convection as it is a, a driver of convection. The same is true for vertical motion. Actually, the peak of the correlation is just after the peak of the rainfall in the area. So that indicates that there's a strong interaction between vertical motion and convection. Okay, so we get very strong um, fall, uh, so convection induces stronger vertical motion, and vertical motion induces stronger convection. But from a parameterization and understanding point of view, what we see at time zero when there's no lag between the two, we still get the largest correlation of any variable with vertical motion. The relative humidity story is interesting and actually quite important. Um, it's quite important for things like extreme rainfall, which many of us are interested in. So I'll show you one more graph before we move on to the last topic. Here, what, we, what I show you on the left-hand side is the rain rate near the surface derived from a radar. And the y-axis is the, as a function of the height of the convective cell. So this is, we're looking at individual convective cells in our radar, and we are asking how much does it rain if the cell is this deep, and if it's that deep, and if it's that deep. So what you see, if cells are not very deep, to come out here. Come on. Don't disappoint me again. Uh, there we go. If the cells are not very deep, the rainfall is relatively light but it increases with the depths of the cells. This white line is the median of this uh, rainfall distribution. So it increases until we get to about seven or so kilometers, seven or eight kilometers after that, the rainfall doesn't increase much anymore with cell height. Um, but when, if the clouds are very deep and go above 15 kilometers or so, there's even a jump, there's a gap in the rainfall and then all the extreme rainfall is actually coming from very, very deep clouds. Okay. So that makes some kind of sense to us. But what is really intriguing is then to ask, okay, what's the atmosphere look like when that happens? And the black line is, what's the atmosphere like when the clouds are not very deep? And you can see it's quite dry. This is relative humidity. Um, the blue lines is when it's sort of in this intermediate range, 10, 11, 12 kilometers. And that's when the atmosphere is very moist. But when you get to the very high rainfall, the atmosphere is dry again. So from this, you can see that really the very intense convection doesn't happen in very moist atmospheres. And we intuitively all know this. When the monsoon is active, the atmosphere is very moist, and the convection bubbles along, and it rains a lot. But it rains a lot because there's lots of convective clouds, not because each of them is particularly strong. But the very strong convection actually happens during the break periods, but it's rare. It's sort of not widespread and intermittent, but where it happens, it's very strong. At least that's true for Australia. And in the break periods, the atmosphere is drier. And what that tells us is there's a need to build up instability to make convection very, very strong. And having the middle troposphere dry helps us build up that instability before the convection can actually release the energy, and then it becomes very strong. Okay, very quick conclusions from this part. So on smaller scales, such as those of climate model grid boxes, convection is not in radiative convective equilibrium. Never, ever, okay, or very, very rarely. Instead, it's strongly coupled to dynamical processes in the atmosphere. The area average convective rainfall is controlled by uh, the area that's raining and not by the rain intensity. So that's a bit counterintuitive and takes a while to get your head around this, but it's a very important finding has been confirmed in several other regions since. And the area average rainfall is closely related to convergence, whilst the intensity is closely related to instability. Final part of my presentation is about can we use any of the things that we've just learned in better representing convection in models? 
Now, your first question should be, well, why do we care? Aren't our models wonderful? Aren't they predicting everything we want to know every day in a wonderful way? Well, the answer is we would like that to be true, but unfortunately it isn't. And I give you evidence for this. This is evidence from the fifth assessment report. This is the multi-model of all the models that have submitted their runs to the CMIP5 archive, and there's about 30 of them. And it's the multi-model error in precipitation. So the top left is the precipitation itself, right here. The top right is the mean error in precipitation, and where it's blue, models are raining too much, and where it's yellow or orange, the models are not raining enough. And what you can see is there's large areas of the tropics where the models are raining too much. If you average this in space, the models are raining too much in the tropics. It's mostly confined over the tropical oceans. Um, you get very large errors in the Western Pacific, you get very large errors in the Western Indian Ocean, in the Atlantic. So very large errors. The bottom right one is the same, but errors in percent. Unfortunately, it doesn't come out very well. But these errors, these overestimations, like in the Indian Ocean here, go up to 60 or 70 percent. So these are large errors. These are not small errors. Um, and they have been rather persistent. So if you go back through all the reports of the IPCC that look at models, they all look the same. In other words, we haven't made much progress over the last few decades in improving this error. Not only do models struggle with uh, representing the mean, they also struggle with representing the variability. You don't need to know much about this plot other than this is the observation and this is two climate models that you use in this country. I picked the two that you use in this country. CFS over here and the MET office model that NCMRWF is now using down there. And what this what this graph depicts is the variability in the tropics. Um, and there's some very famous modes of variability. This one along those lines are Kelvin waves. Here's some Rossby mixed Rossby gravity waves. And this big red blob is the Madden Julian oscillation. And if our models were representing these very well, they should have these red areas or orange areas. Well, I don't need to take much time to convince you that neither of those two models and many other models, I don't want to pick on those two, I just wanted to show examples, but many of those models are not able to represent even the basic modes of climate variability in the tropics. Okay, so that's the state of affairs. Um, so who's to blame for this? Well. The common wisdom in the community, and I don't think the community is terribly wrong in this, is that, that uh, convection needs to be parameterized in models, and it's these parameterizations that cause all the troubles. Um, and that's when Partha and I duck and try and stay out of the limelight, because that's when everybody is accusing us of not doing a good job. Um, so what's parameterization? For most of you, that's a very alien word. So here it is in a nutshell, and I'm not going to really dwell on this very long. We have a grid box. There it is, the black line. In that grid box, we have processes that go on that are acting on scales that are smaller than our grid box. As a result, the solutions to the equations that we numerically solve in our supercomputers do not include those processes anymore. They're excluded by design. So we need to re-put them back in. We do that by assuming that any variable um, that we can think of temperature, wind, pressure, has a mean and a perturbation. And at any point in the grid box, we can represent it by that mean and that perturbation. We then do a bit of mathematics, and we end up with equations for our variables that have terms that have only means. And those are the ones that we can solve with our numerical methods on the computer. But then there are also some terms left in the equations where we have only perturbations. And those we can't solve because they happen on scales smaller than the grid box. And then we invent a parameterization. We invent a, a statistical model or a physical model or both that relates these perturbation terms to the large scale terms that we know. And in convection, we do this by the so called mass flux approach, where the mass flux is just an area. Um, covered by convection, and this should ring a bell now in your head because we just looked at that from observations, times the velocity inside the clouds. Okay? And people have struggled for decades to try and uh, uh, re 
represent convection that way. And we have done a lot of work, but we haven't really been able to address many of the large errors. So what we are doing is we're trying collectively in the community, in my group and many other groups, we're trying completely new approaches to this. And here's how we are going to approach the problem. Um, and this is almost my last graph. So here's our GCM grid, and then within that GCM grid, we are building a smaller grid um, where we say in each of those little grid points within one of the big grid cells of a GCM, we will predict with a statistical model the state of convection for each of those little cells. And there can be more than one state. There can be shallow clouds, congested clouds, deep clouds, and so on. And they could be organized into lines and all the things we see in the real atmosphere. And then the next step, we're going to take this and tilt it. And we're going to run a model of a cloud for each of those little points or for a collection of points to represent convection. Well, does it work? We have some hope. Here's the funky, funky graph, slightly different time period and slightly and drawn by different people. So they always look a little bit different. But here's your Kelvin waves, here's the MJO, um, here's the westward propagating systems. You can see the control model with the traditional parameterization looks like this, and the model where we've introduced our new parameterization, a very early prototype, looks like that. So we have hope. We have hope that representing convection in a slightly innovative and completely new way, very similar work to what's being done here at IITM, actually. Um, could lead to a major improvement of our treatment of convection. So final conclusions of this part is that global and weather and climate models have major shortcomings in representing tropical convection. We should not be afraid to say this to people, because if we don't, um, we will never improve. As I said to the students this week, um, solving this problem is going to be hard. Okay? It's a hard problem. All the easy problems in modeling have been solved. I'm sorry you're too late for that. All the easy stuff has been done. What's left is the hard stuff. And what that means is that we really, really need to invest heavily into solving these hard problems by putting lots of people, lots of bright young people in particular, on working on these problems. And many of them will fail. And we have to nurture them and we have to help them because many of them will not solve the problems. But that's OK. Don't worry about it. The old guys haven't solved them either. So you're good, right? Um, so by putting lots of people onto this problem, we might have a chance, because people will come up with different ideas. And since we don't know what to do, we need many ideas. This is, by the way, how many other fields of science work. They actually, and they have a hard problem, they throw a large number of people on that problem. And they all want to work on that problem. Our field, on the other hand, we all want to work on easy problems, it seems, and we need to change that. So please come and work on hard problems. Because these errors in the parameterizations lead to large errors in both the mean climate and the climate variability. In this country, you know this very well, very, very few, if any, climate models do a good job at representing the Indian monsoon. That's the state of affair that we can't tolerate forever. We have to do something about that. And we have to do it by solving the physics of the problem, not by trying to adjust some parameters and hope it counts, because it won't. A main contributor to these errors is our inability to link large-scale motion to convection through this process that we call parameterization. And there are new ideas and there are new frameworks out there that will allow us to do a better job in the future. So I'm extremely optimistic that we're going to solve this problem you're going to solve this problem in the room. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you once again for having me here and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you very much. Yes, if there are questions, I'm very happy, happy to take them. <laughs>